And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Sinchan people. Chris has a distinguished career that spans multiple sectors, including business, indigenous affairs, and resource development. He is the principal owner and president of Blackfish Enterprises, where he provides strategic advice and planning to indigenous communities and industry stakeholders, both domestically and internationally in the energy sector. On today's Open Connection, Chris Sankey. I'm from the coast of Simshian, Chris Sankey from the community of Lakua Lambs, which means Island of Roses. I am Gisbet Wadakit Welkyots. You're also a business owner, is that correct? I own Blackfish Enterprises. I'm also a partner in Blackfish Industries and involved in a few ventures that still have yet to, to move forward. Uh, but because I've decided to um, uproot everything I, I, I'm, I'm doing, uh, I made a commitment to run for the, the BC provincial elections coming up under the Conservative uh, Party. This isn't the first time you've actually thrown your hat into the public service arena. You did um, well, also worked for the First Nations community, right? I did. I, I was elected for Lockwell Lambs two times, sober. Um, uh, lots of challenges, but lots of rewards. I mean, when you when you step up to work for your community or be elected for your community, it's, it's a lot of work. And I don't think the public really understands just how complex it is of a, a system. And more so, it's because we just don't have the capacity. And when I say capacity, it's the resources that we need in order to function as a government. Uh, when you're an elected body, you are responsible from everything from the kitchen sink to a multi-billion dollar project. So the way I try to explain to people when they're dealing with indigenous governance is you're dealing with the regional office, provincial office, uh, the city, municipality, uh, and federal. We're all bundled in one kind of accord. And that's just reality of what we're faced with because we just don't have the 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 person or man or woman power to um, fulfill a lot of these positions. And a lot of the times our communities are remote, so to attract good talent and capacity, it's it's a real challenge. Even you know, Lock Lambs is, is uh, you know the community is only 24 kilometers north of Prince Rupert, and we struggle with capacity. So even the best of them have a hard time do, with recruitment and retention. What inspired you to decide to run for MLA in North Coast? That's a great question, and I get asked that a lot. One is my children. Uh, I want to see a better future and life for them. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm always taught to, to think that for the next seven generations and beyond. And watching the current state of our economy and watching the current state of our social economic uh, that comes with that responsibility, it, it, it's just in... It's in shambles right now, um, and I and quite frankly, I, I'm really tired of the North Coast Haida Gwaii riding being left out of the equation. Um, people in this riding deserve better. The I mean, this riding should be filled with all the resources uh, from from medical to economics to education to frontline workers. We should never have to struggle for that based on the amount of industry and economic activity that's circulated this region for for a few decades now you got the port related developments uh industry all around us and people can't even get access to a doctor that's wrong touched on something that had happened earlier this year i understand that the emergency room and prince rupert closed because lack of staffing there's a combination of things, but I mean, they laid off a lot of healthcare workers who disagreed with the vaccine, as well as uh, a lot of people have, have quit or left because they just, the environment was very difficult to work in. Um, nurses are, are, are stretched to the max um, and doctors are leaving because of the policies around healthcare. Um, you know, we're supposed to, as a community, we are supposed to reward the local doctors and nurses who stay committed and loyal to the region and to the communities that we that I'm going to look to represent, we shouldn't be penalizing them. And so, what would you know? What's stopping a, a doctor from leaving Prince Rupert or Haida Gwaii or Central Coast when they're incentivized to leave and make more money by flying in to provide the very services we need on a daily basis? 
And uh, I, I just think that's wrong. I think we need to be rewarding doctors that stay committed. Uh, there's a lot of really good doctors and nurses that have left it's, and at no fault of their own. But, you know, I don't blame a lot of these individuals or if not all, any of them because you got to make a decision based on your own um, needs as a family. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thanks for staying with us. BC's healthcare system is in crisis. Nearly 1 million British Columbians are on wait lists to receive care from a specialist, often with increasing pain while their conditions worsen. Physicians are facing unprecedented levels of burnout and stress due to the immense challenges they face to provide care not to mention the moral distress they feel when they continue to see their patients suffering despite their best efforts. Let us return the conversation with Chris. Um, but I, what I do know is that I know a lot of, uh, and in, in any given sector, a lot of people that come to Prince Supert or this riding look at this as a means of a stepping stone for experience, and then they leave. And then with that is all that money and time and resources spent to train them and get them their experience and they take off and they go to Vancouver, Kelowna or elsewhere uh, to a bigger center. So we need to be able to have a recruitment and retention strategy. We need to be able to sit down with the local doctors in this entire riding, along with the nurses and community reps to determine what the problems are because they're telling us what the problems are. Uh, it's a lack of resources. It's the fact you're closing emergency wards. You're having to get people to travel to Terrace, which is centralized. Uh, what if Mother Nature isn't agreeing that day? I mean, I'm hearing, I've heard stories in our own hospital where people have died just waiting in the hallway. And, and that's right across the board and that needs to stop. I just don't think, I know like this whole um, healthcare system they, they developed thought was in the best interest by centralizing certain regions. It's not working. Uh, if you took a, take a look at what was just on the news, news last night, uh, the physicians from Surrey Memorial sent a scolding letter to the Fraser Health Authority outlining all of the uh, conditions and impacts that's, that's occurring in that hospital. And that's a major center. So if they're struggling and running into all these problems where patients are at risk uh, of further damage to their health or worse death. How do you think we feel in the north? And we're and, and look and ge geographically. Before all this, it was complex. Just ge geographically, you're either air or, or you're either air or boat in this riding, and so now add the current structure that they have, where it feels like the doctors and nurses and patients are totally forgotten about, and it's all about management on top of management on top of management, where we should be pouring those resources into the frontline workers and working with the expertise that are local that do want to stay committed to this riding. Those are the individuals I want to talk to and form a committee to come up with a strategy to combat this. This is not going to happen overnight. It's it, it's a real challenge. The healthcare system in, in British Columbia has, is broken, in my opinion, based on my conversations uh, with those in the medical field. Now, of course, one of those things that we're dealing with here in the North that we're not really used to, or it's, I guess it's more out in the open, is the opioid crisis that is happening. Do you feel that the NDP has handled that correctly? No, as a person who struggled with drug addiction, I, I'm telling you, there's no such thing as safe supply. Uh, you know, I was speaking with the experts in uh, recovery and, and drug and alcohol counseling, and they predicted what was going to happen when the, when the NDP announced, they predicted what was going to happen with safe supply and hard drugs. I mean, you could walk around uh, the community with two grams of cocaine or hard drugs and you won't be charged. It's legal. And what was, what, what was predicted by the experts in this field, these are all local people, was that that safe supply was gonna get into the hands of kids. And then that safe supply was then gonna be in turn exchanged for hard drugs. And with the fentanyl, the dangers of fentanyl, you're now playing Russian roulette uh, with these hard drugs. And the fact that we've not been able to get a, a handle on that, the fact that these drugs are still coming into the community, we it's wrong, we gotta do something about it. I'm all too familiar with that life. And, and I'm telling you, it's not gonna stop. 
until we pour more resources into uh, RCMP, uh, mental health workers, drug and alcohol outreach workers, addiction uh, counselors, uh, help for recovery and ongoing resources for when they want to get back into society and get a job and function at home as a, as a, as a family person. I mean, look, nobody chooses that life just out of, out of the blue. There's trauma related to that. And we need to help the, those individuals that, that need help to deal with past trauma or whatever it may look like. And, and, and under, I understand that, that particular piece of it, because I was there. You know, I used to tell people that, uh, you know, I was the functioning addict. I could, you know, I, I dressed well, I talked well, but deep down I was struggling and I had to take it, it upon myself because I was, I damaged my relationship. I damaged my, you know, my, but damaging my, my relationship with my children. And I had to really look long and hard in the mirror then and realize that I was the problem. And so I always tell people, you don't have to be an addict or sorry, you don't have to be in the down county side to be an addict. It's happening in our homes, behind closed doors with everyday people that we know and they are friends or our family. We need to stop the legalization of hard drugs. We've gone backwards. I mean, just uh, just last week, the they, 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 they hospitals uh, found dispensaries uh, where you could learn how to start math, how to start hard drugs. Like, what? I don't get it. Robert, I don't understand how we got here. And, and the fact that we've become so complacent with this issue that we have allowed this to happen to our communities has only manifested more violence and more drugs. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a real quick story. I, you know, a friend of mine, uh, James Harry Sr. is an outreach worker, a drug and alcohol reach worker, worker in the downtown east side. And I wanted to meet with him because I was hearing that a lot of our community members, indigenous or non, are ending up on the downtown east side. And so I went to go meet with him and he said there's a significant amount from the Haida to the Simshian to the Nishka to Halpsik to Newhawk. I mean, we're, they're ending up down there. And he told me a very, really shocking story, which now seems is to be the norm. Uh, he was speaking with a 13 year old homeless uh, First Nation. And the young man said that he wasn't the youngest down there. There were 10 to 12 year olds. Something is seriously wrong with this picture. Robert and the fact that we've gotten to this point and allowed it to get to this point is wrong and we need to do something about it. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. The recent opioid crisis within Canada has caused publicly funded programs to become regularly always at capacity. Each year, billions of dollars are spent on healthcare in Canada, but merely 7% is allocated for mental health, with only a portion of that set aside to treat addiction. Let us return the conversation with Chris. Yeah, look, I, I'm going to go directly to the, the individuals that live and breathe a recovery. Uh, I want to go to the Trinity House. I want to go to the doctors and nurses and the mental health care workers that are local to the riding. I want to go to the elders. I want to go to the community outreach workers and form a committee, a task force committee to get our hospital. First of all, the emergency ward needs to open back up. This is crazy because Prince Rupert is the hub for the coastal communities. Old Masset is the hub for the northern communities in Haida Hawaii. Like we need to open this back up and form the local experienced healthcare professional expertise in a committee to work with the indigenous communities in the, in, in the riding to start getting us back on track. We need to lobby the government. I need to lobby hard both with not only just government, we got to hold industry accountable as well. We got to be able to match those dollars to mac maximize our investment. Uh, into the healthcare field and understand that uh, this isn't going to just take one body. This is going to be a number of people working together simultaneously to solve the problems that we are currently uh, uh, looking at. I'm not the healthcare expert, so I'm going to go to the very people that live and breathe this, and that's the nurses and doctors and people, frontline workers that see this every day. We have healthcare that needs to be done, but there's got to be a way of actually paying for that. And that can only happen through tax dollars and, and, and reviving the economy. And we need something along the lines of economic reconciliation. Do you, do you agree with that? I agree with you 100%, Robert. Look, we got to be able to pay for these services. Don't get me wrong. 
We need a socioeconomic economy. We need to be able to help those who need a hand up, not a hand out. We also need to help those with disabilities. But in order for that to take place, we need a healthy economy to do so, to pay for those things. Everybody thinks government has all this money. Well, no. Where do they think they get the money? They get it from the tax benefits, uh, whether it's land or projects. We got to be able to get to production so that we can look at these viable projects. People forget that Prince Rupert has a diverse economy. We have the port, we have Trigon, which is coal, and we have Prince Rupert Grain, we have Pembina, and now Altagas. And all of them are looking to move product to Tidewater to get out to open market. So there's all these opportunities around gas. And I know the topic of oil, people always ask me that. People are always going to be against that. There's a lot of people who always say they're against oil, but I want, I would just want people to understand one thing that we are never getting away from oil and gas, not in my lifetime. Alberta First Nations are fully engaged in that. So that's their economy. That's great. Here, we want to look at LNG. We want to look at the opportunities that could be viable for this region to region. So we could replace, replace coal into the ever a uh, growing, uh, developing world. When we looked at China and India and all these other places, that places, third world countries that just don't have basic electricity. There are 750 million people around the world that don't have basic electricity. And there are between 25 and 30,000 kids dying every year in the developing world just to eat because their families are having to utilize harmful fields just to cook a meal. Uh, this, that's wrong. Canada could play Canada's First Nation and Canada as a partner could play an inspirational inspirational role of developing clean fields to the rest of the world so that we don't see these kids dying, that we see these other countries being lifted up and taking advantage of the economic engine in this beautiful world that we call Earth. And so I think at the end of the day, it's, a, it, it's going to be a global push. It's going to be a, a opportunity where we could unite as one voice and partner with British Columbia and Canada so we could move our province forward. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. According to the Northwest Resource Benefits website, if we can improve the physical and social infrastructure of our communities, we can support existing businesses and new resource development to build sustainable communities, not just work camps. This will allow us to attract workers we need to grow our service and tourism sectors and to show our potential as an ideal place for professionals and families to grow. In this final segment of Open Connection, Chris shares his thoughts. The municipalities have worked on an RBA um, where that's going to change and we want to support that. Look, we got to be able to bring bigger tax dollars here and support the cap, so, sorry, support the RBA and so that we could incentivize industry to come here. But look, we, our municipalities need money. Um, Prince Hubert is a population of, of about 12,000 people. But there's only about between 5,500 and 6,000 paying taxes. So that that population is paying for an infrastructure that is accommodating 12 to 15,000 people. It's just almost impossible to make the numbers work. So we need to be able to attract the industry, but at the same time, hold them accountable to start paying taxes back into the riding. It's, it's only fair. And at the same time, we also got to make sure our municipalities also play ball around where, what level of taxes they want to be able to charge in people. I'm all in favor of both. And I want to be able to just attract investment, both financially and from industry to help grow our communities, because it isn't just about a project. It's about when you're looking at a proposed project, make sure that you help grow the, the community in the process and not just take the money you made and leave the writing and go somewhere else. That needs to stop. We need to stop the economic leakage. We need to stop the investment leakage that leaves this writing and goes into different countries or different areas or different provinces. And like the Lower Mainland, the Lower Mainland receives a lot of the benefits that we don't get to see when we, we have a, a very good part here that is going to be growing substantially in the coming years. We need to be able to see the payback back into this writing.
in the North Coast District, there, there are a, a number of First Nations communities. And it's almost, you could say, there's a hidden economic power there. Do you believe that if you're elected to MLA, you'll be able to start um, tapping into that resource to help um, everyone in the North Coast? I, I know a lot of the leaders and people in the communities now that are leaders themselves and trying to advance their communities. And I met a lot of them just through basketball, um, through the All Native Tournament. And now we're all we're in these roles where we're leading our communities. And I, I've always said that we need to be able to get into the room, and I, and and speaking with people from Haida and Benishka and elsewhere. I mean, one of these days I would love to see a, a flag of the Haida, the Simshian, the Heltsik, the New Hawks and our neighbors of Prince Hubert and Port Edward and Hagensburg and, and Bella Coola and all these places uh, that encompass who we are as a people in this writing, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Uh, I think it's high time now, Robert, that we get out of our own way uh, and we start lifting each other up. We can't be holding each other back. We can't be holding one part of the region back because the other part of the region isn't ready. That's not how economics works. The global economy waits for nobody. And right now, indigenous people, indigenous communities in partnership with our municipalities have a golden opportunity to attract international investment, not just international investment, but domestic investment to advance this writing. This writing should be full of opportunity. It should be, it should be humming with services that the people of this writing deserve and I intend to try to make that happen and I and I and I've told lots of people in this writing that I'm never going to promise you something I can't deliver on but I will bring your voices to Victoria to make sure it's heard and come back with solutions because they're the ones uh, are going to are they're the ones who are going to be the solution providers themselves let's start tapping into the local people that understand this writing and stop looking on from the outside because although we need help around capacity, we got to start tapping into those business minded individuals and the socially conscious to come together under root one roof and advance Haida Gwaii, North Coast Haida Gwaii. It's, 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 it's so crucial. We're at a crucial point in our time that we can no longer let, let all this opportunity slip by us. We have a healthy economy, the doctors, the nurses, police officers, paramedics, firefighters, you name it, people will come because they see the economics that's going to benefit the people in the riding. And I also want people to know that this isn't about me. This isn't about the NDP. This isn't about the conservative. It's about people. So let's start celebrating the people who helped build our communities. And let's not go into this as a us versus them. This should, this should never have been we should have never gone to that point where our healthcare system has become a political football. Healthcare should be universal. It should have never been on the table to kick around like a football. And we got to stop silencing those who are trying to fix it. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but it connects from his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensely within. I'm Robert Pictou.